Welcome to the all-new Whiskey Lore podcast called Whiskey Lore The Interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experience in Kentucky Bourbon. And to kick things off and welcome you in, I have three brand new interviews that I collected during my recent travels through Tennessee. And my first stop was in Nashville, which is a town I used to live in. And my first guest is Jeff Pennington, the co-founder of Pennington Distillery. And Pennington is a distillery that he founded with his wife, Jenny. And if you're a whiskey fan, you may know of one of their products, which is Davidson Reserve. And while I'd seen bottles of Davidson Reserve on my local store shelf, I got to admit, I didn't know much about it. So on a previous trip to Nashville, I decided to take a tour of their distillery, which is in a neighborhood on the west side of Nashville. As you come driving up to it, it looks like it's a military barracks at first. But once inside, it is all distillery. You see over to the side a tasting area and some barrels. And then towards the back, they're doing the bottling line. But as I was looking at the products, I not only saw bottled whiskey, but I also saw canned products. So during the interview, we're going to find out a little bit about what they are canning at the distillery. Now, about halfway through the tour, Jeff came up to me and we started chatting a little bit about whiskey history, the rebirth of Tennessee whiskey, rye whiskey, and the issues with making rye whiskey. And... I asked him, because he was in a hurry and he needed to get going to a meeting, if we could potentially schedule a conversation, an interview that would allow me to introduce him to you. And so he graciously accepted that invitation. And what makes these guys really interesting, Jeff and his wife, they didn't actually get into the distilling business along the normal route. Rather than having grown up around distilling, these guys came from careers in the distribution of whiskey. And in fact, they actually worked for competing companies. So we're going to talk a little bit about how they came to be in the distilling business. We're going to look a little closer at how distilling came back to Tennessee. I learn a little bit more with each person that I talk to in Tennessee. And we'll get into the developing of mash bills blending versus distilling. And we're going to find out what the Pennington method is. And this is something that it's said goes back to the very origins of bourbon whiskey. But to start our conversation, I figured I'd dig into two subjects that were in the front of my mind. One being that since I lived in Nashville, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the changing skyline of Nashville And also, I wanted to find out more about the unique design of this distillery. So enjoy my conversation with Jeff Pennington of Pennington Distillery, the maker of Davidson Reserve. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. So you have an interesting complex here when I, I walk in. Do you know what this building was in its past history? So before us... When we took over, it was a construction company. Um, so uh, a contractor, basically, construction company. I think he's kind of an all-around GC. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that there's a lot of hodgepodge pieces. I think whatever construction he had done the last job was yeah. kind of, you know, whatever piece were left over, that's what he built the next piece of the building with, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, when we first moved in, we were getting our CO and we went down to codes and they're like, hey, we don't even have the three buildings on the back on the drawings. <laughs> and it was almost became a problem. We're like, look, we didn't, we didn't yeah, build yeah. it, <laughs> you know? Um, so, and then before that, <clears throat> we don't know for sure, but I think there was some kind of telecommunication or call center yeah. in the in the Quonset Hut building because we had to rip out just unbelievable amounts of phone lines. Mm. There was a huge phone book, of, you know, like old school, it's like almost the size of that wall, of just all these switches and wire telephone things. So we think it was a telephone. At some point there was like a call center or some kind of telecommunication, something in there. Um, 
And then the farthest I can see back is that there was a concrete company here at some point. Okay. Um, this street was a very industrial street. So if you look up the marble and stone, people are still there. There was a concrete plant here at one point. There was, you know, so I, up and down, there's lots of wood. So yeah. if you go on the other the railroad tracks from behind us, and then on the other side of that is a lot of lumber yards. Yeah. Um, that Quonset hut makes it look almost military. Yeah, you, you know, that's what really, did, well, two things brought us to this. One, the rent was affordable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and two, I, I like the building of the, it, it was just like, it was like an airplane hangar. It looked really cool. And it's actually great. It's a, it's a well-insulated, it's a, they're really good designed. I've, I've learned more about Quonset huts since, you know, but uh, we first moved in, we're like, oh, look how cool. It's like a, it's like a, you know, military hangar and, uh, and then we quickly realized it's not an ideal warehouse because you can't stack anything up against the walls. Because uh. <laughs> it all falls <laughs> in on you. So, nice. um, you know, we started off just in there and we had other people that were kind of leasing the other warehouses and offices. And then over time, we just kept expanding and expanding. And now we have this property and then we have two other warehouses off site. So okay. it's not the most efficient uh, way to have to to get to run a business we've got a warehouse that has all our dry goods yeah so, and then we have a warehouse that has all our finished goods so we have to bring our dry goods in bottle it you know package it take it to the shipping warehouse and it ships out from there uh, the only thing that is holy here is our distilling right now so we do all our in the back we do all of our our distilling on site yeah. and then our barrels we're, we're out of space on barrels here and then so now we're moving barrels off site eventually we you know we've been looking for a couple of years to find a property to kind of bring it all back together finding property in nashville right now in the past few years is i keep waiting thinking that there's going to be like a bubble where this thing's yeah. going to stop going up and it's just not stopping what's going on with the skyline because uh it used to be when i lived here that the the bat building at&t building downtown was like the center of the skyline now you can't even see it we had this we went the last weekend or two weekends ago to see wilco i don't know if you know who they are yes yeah. yeah. i love that band we went down and there's an amphitheater downtown called sin it's really cool and we were sitting there, and it was me and three other, my wife and three other couples. We were having the same discussion, like, you can't even see the Batman building anymore. <laughs> like, like, it's cool that our city's growing, yeah, yeah, yeah. but we can't even see the Batman that's building. A, that's that's an like an our iconic, signature. Yeah, it's Maybe, an you know, and building. I don't know if when you lived here, but the Tennessee Tower used to always light up and have messages every night. Yeah. You know, they would do the lights, and so it was, the Bat it was that, and then the Batman building, and those were kind of the two iconics. And you, know, you had the Renaissance that had the spinning restaurant. You can't even see all that anymore. Yeah. And what I'm really afraid of, and I'm not afraid, I, I like Noon. I'm, I'm not against the growth of Nashville. I'm just so, going to be a little more disappointed that if you follow the interstates around, you're getting these really tall condos yeah. that are kind of blocking the view of downtown from the interstate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, where we live over in Sylvan Park, you know, you go up in the hill and it really looks cool. Like a friend of ours lives up and they've got this house at the top of the hill in Sylvan Park. and. I mean, you can see the hall in Nashville and the cranes. My favorite new building that they're actually building is Vanderbilt's redoing their dorm building. Mm. And they've got this new, it's a limestone tower. It looks like it's straight out of this, like Harvard or something. Oh, wow. I mean, it's beautiful and it lights up at night. And so just a really tall tower. Yeah. It turns out it's a dorm room. I'm like, man, it doesn't look like my dorm room. <laughs> I went to in my college. But, uh, right. But there's, I mean, it's good and negative, but I do miss the Batman building and yeah, the Tennessee yeah, yeah. Tower. I wish maybe they could just maybe lift the, the Batman building up like 10 stories so <laughs> it's still stilts. stood up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so this is a family business, mm -hmm. and you got into the whiskey business. You were actually already in the whiskey business, but in a different capacity. Kind of give us a, a background on, on what you were doing before you started. Yeah, so... You know, when I was grew up, my family was in the hospitality business. Uh, my my father uh, owned restaurants and bars, and and so you know I always worked in those. I grew up in working in restaurants. And I started at probably you know, probably wouldn't want people me telling people twelve and thirteen is out there bussing tables for tips. You know, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, there's a what it's, do you call it a, a statute, statute of limitations, limitations on child labor yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> You know. No. So I've worked, I've worked every position there, started and then about 15, got to start working in the kitchen and, and, and worked in the kitchen element till about 18. I really enjoyed that and I realized it's not, it's hard money. It's yeah. hard to make money in there. It's kind of sad to see that industry because they feed, you know, I, it's the second largest employer, my dad told me, behind the federal government mm. is, is restaurants mm -hmm. in the hospitality industry. So um, 
which is obviously what was the hardest hit in 2020. Yeah, and yeah. I think you know it's it's taken a really slow comeback. The business is there; they're drinking from a fire hose, but they don't. The labor's <laughs> not there. Yeah. So I'm interested to see what the game changes. I think you know I think you're going to start seeing people have to raise prices and raise wages, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. But you know, so I went to college. Uh, and went up to Knoxville. I went to University of Tennessee. And, you know, I wish I would have left the state, but I, I, for some reason, when I was in high school, I just didn't even think about college. I was just kind of having fun, and then all of a sudden, I graduated and I had decent grades and good test scores. So I was like, I was like, "Where are you going?" I was like, "Oh, I haven't applied anywhere." <laughs> so I ended up going to Tennessee because I applied in the summer before. Yeah, and uh, bartended up in college, and which was a great job to have in college because you didn't have to work near the hours and. You still made good money and I wanted to go to law school um, and so I, I was an economics and political science major and thought I'd go to law school and I was going to try to come back and do my JD MBA program at, at Vanderbilt and I kind of went out the end I realized I didn't like school mm-hmm. and I was like you know what I'm gonna take a year off you know and figure out if I really want to do this before I go commit you know five more years of, of college and so you know back in those days you know you didn't have cell phones and and I think Google might have existed, maybe, but you know, you got the old <laughs> newspaper out. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 exactly. And you started flipping around looking for a job, yeah. right? I mean, now you, there's probably a hundred job sites, and so I just started circling all the jobs that that looked interesting to me, and every one of the ones that I liked pretty much required two to four years of sales experience, mm-hmm. and so I was like, well, sounds like I need to go get some sales experience. <laughs> So I was bartending one night and, you know, it hit me. I saw one of the people coming in that sold us wine and spirits. And I said, you're in the, it worked for a distributor. I said, you're in the wine and spirits and you're in the sales industry. Yeah, this is, I'm a sales rep. I was like, oh, awesome. I was like, so how do I apply for your job? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, well, I don't want you to take my job. I was like, well, no, I mean, just in general, like, yeah, well, yeah. Here's, here's the people and here's the thing. So, and I learned then about wholesalers and distributors and the three tier system. You know, I would have just thought, and I'm sure most people, it's a, I still get people that come in here for co-packing. Oh, well, I'm going to, you know, I was like, who's your distributor? What do you mean? I'm going to sell it myself. I, I still think there's <laughs> probably a, a massive amount of, of the population that probably doesn't understand the three-tier system and yeah. how it's set up. So I never knew there was these distributors in the middle. So I sent out my, I built a resume um, and sent it out to a bunch of distributors around the state and was lucky enough that I got hired and uh, found that luckily a job had opened up. And I started, went into uh, Horizon Wine and Spirits here in Nashville. I started in the point of sale area. Probably, mm-hmm. I think I was making 22000 a year. Nice. You know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, uh, making way less than I was bartending. The job, the job everybody wants, so they don't pay you that much. Exactly. Yeah. It, was, it was the leg in, right? Yeah, so exactly. Back then, it was the only way in. And, and sadly, there wasn't hardly any women in the industry at the time. So, you know, that was a grunt job. You went and stacked cases at distribute. At, retail stores and built displays and moved inventory in and out and you know did price signs so you know it was a grunt job and but that was the only way into a sales role at mm-hmm. the time um so i did that and uh, then i got it promoted to a pre-sale ah. manager which was just a glorified version of the same thing except <laughs> you maybe had less accounts yeah um and then um and then i, I finally got a sales role uh in retail one and I, I got in that, and about, it took about eight months, which isn't that long from the time I got hired to get into it, and and just loved it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't even really know a ton about wine at the time, but you know, luckily we were a Gallo house mm-hmm. and Cobrand house, and one thing I know about those two is they they're really great on education, mm-hmm. and not just wine education, but sales education. You know, the Gallo sales manual I still use with my people today. Nice. I mean, it to me it's the ultimate like sales training for our industry um and then i realized about three years after that i wanted to learn the on-premise because i knew i i didn't want to do one job forever I've, I've never been someone that just likes to sit around and do the same thing so i uh i, I went to on-premise at that point which is the liquor by the drink so hosp- you know hospitality hotels venues restaurants um i'm sure you're people know, but, um, you know, on-premise is considered anywhere where liquor by the drink is sold, off-premise is retail package where it's sold by the bottle. So went to on-premise and spent a few years in on-premise. Really love that. Um, You know, I got nicknamed by all my retail guys because most people go the other way. They start in on-premise to go to retail. So they all nicknamed me Clank because they said that's the sound bottles make because, you know, in (laughs) on-premise you're selling bottles versus cases. Um, 
And so, you know, after, uh, during that time, I, I met my wife, which actually I knew my wife from high school. We, we had been friends for a long time and never dated, never anything romantic. But she was actually one of the first, you know, at that, at that point in time, this was probably 2003 or four, you started seeing more and more women getting into the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when I moved in, there was probably like three or four women in the total or out of like 20 something sales reps at our company. Wow. Now I'm, imagine, I don't even know, but I imagine at least even if not majority women. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, my wife was one of the few women in the industry and I was competing against her. And, and so we, you know, we kind of took a liking to each other and started secretly dating and, <laughs> and uh, we dated. Sw- swapping secrets. Yeah, oh, it was so funny. <laughs> we kept it a secret. We'd go to like non-alcohol serving establishments. We ate a lot of Calypso Cafe and all these places that didn't serve alcohol because we knew we wouldn't run into anybody <laughs> there, right? Um, for about a year. And then, you know, the, the entrepreneurial bug had always been in me, but I think it kind of bit me around that time when I, you know, I started getting more serious with, with my future wife and realized I loved her and, you know, I kind of wanted to move on to the next step of my life. And so I, I went to my bosses and I said, look, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I, I kind of want to go off on my own and I want to start something. And this is probably 2008. Mm-hmm. And and I, I put in my notice and I started a, a digital software business and it kind of went a different direction. I imagine like most people's first business, but at the time I wanted to make wine kiosk, um, mm. where you could go into a retail store and you could search wine by you know twenty different types of search functions. This is once again pre pre Google. Right now there's apps galore. At yeah, the time yeah, yeah, it was yeah. so cutting edge. Three years later it was so <laughs> archaic. But you know, Wait, welcome um, to my world. But yeah. you could go into a liquor store and you could say, hey, I want to have a you know a, a, a red wine from this region that's under twenty dollars that has ninety plus points, or yeah. I want a Sauvignon Blanc that's uh, you know fifteen dollars to twenty dollars that's you know, from California and all, you know, do any endless kind of searches and, and find one. And it was really intrigued me. I started working on it and uh, it was a passion project. And then I quickly realized this is before iPads existed. Um, you know, it was gonna be, the equipment was very, very expensive to, yeah. to the hardware for it. I mean, touch screens and all that was brand new on the market. Um, so we're like, well, how are people gonna be able to afford this? So I ended up doing digital signage for advertising. I was like, well, I'll do advertising. And I started putting that, you know, putting some of those out to try to pay for the other equipment and then quickly realized, oh, there's revenue here. Mm. And so like any other business, you kind of start following the revenue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because you gotta pay <laughs> then you gotta pay your mortgage, right? right. Yeah. And um, and then lucky enough, uh, in 2009, I was approached by a larger company that we had we had built our own proprietary software. And so a larger local company reached out that worked with over 5,000 hotels and they, they just wanted the software. They mm. didn't really care about the, the advertising business. It's not like they didn't care. They, it was small potatoes. They, but they offered us you know, a good bit of money to, or, or not a good bit, not like what you hear, no stupid numbers. <laughs> no, when you're retirement money, yeah. but well worth more than it was worth yeah. um, to come in and, and, and basically help them take the software and turn it into digital signage for hotels because they had a built-in customer base, which made sense. It was cheaper for them to probably buy us than to build their own software or go and license it from one of the bigger companies. Yeah. Um, so we, we went and did that, and I went and worked for that company for about a year on the integration. And at that time, you know, my wife and I got married that year, and so we were like, well, what do we want to do? And I, we just both missed the, the alcohol industry. Mm. You know, we had spent about two, two years out of it, and this was 2009. So we heard the grumblings of the liquor laws changing here, but at that point in time, we never considered doing our own distillery because it wasn't possible you yeah know, we couldn't do anything here unless we went to Moore County or Lincoln County and so we were like you know what and I was always in, uh, obsessed with a guy named Sidney Frank um, that did Sidney Frank imports um, he, the Jägermeister uh, Grey Goose mm. uh, Gekka Kansaki he's got quite a track record yeah of, of successful brands that he kind of signed the rights to and imported or created and, and you know did very well with and I said, all right, well, why don't we, for our honeymoon, why don't we go spend, you know, three or four weeks in Europe and let's go find a brand that we can import and we'll, we'll import a brand. Mm, okay. And that was kind of our idea. And so we, we did, and we went over there and we went from Turkey to Greece to uh, Italy and, you know, France and Belgium. And what we realized, no matter where we go, 
anywhere from Istanbul to Athens to Rome to you'd say Tennessee and everybody in the world knows two things. Jack Daniels and Elvis Presley. And a lot of Dolly Partons. A lot of the Dolly Parton, I, I yeah. gotta give her credit. She's yeah. got she's got some international she, pull. She's got a brand. I, I like, yeah. And I love Dolly Parton. The older yeah. I've got now that I've got a kid, her whole free book that, I mean, she's an incredible person. Yeah. I, I, I really respect her, but a lot of Dolly Partons. And um, you know, we're like, man, I knew Jack Daniels was big. I didn't realize how big globally it was, mm-hmm. you know, until, cause we were, we'd go into all these bars and just look on the back bar, like, what do they have? You know, what's something that we don't see? And we quickly realized, you know, Europe's was like America. It's all big brands too. Yeah, There wasn't a lot of craft brands or, or smaller brands. And, but we started, you know, kind of just adding up. What do we see everywhere? Well, Jack Daniels was in every bar we'd go to. Like, you know, why are we over here looking for a brand when we're from Tennessee and we knew because I sold Makers and Wild Turkey and she sold Jim Beam and Sazerac. She was selling Sazerac when she used to give you flat screen TVs if you would buy a Buffalo Trace from her. Wow. You know, now wow. you got to give them a flat screen TV to get Buffalo <laughs> Trace. Um, but we knew there was all these great Kentucky bourbons and we knew the bourbon category was growing, but there was really no Tennessee whiskeys outside of Jack and George. And there was one distillery called Pritchard's uh, right. who, who was the third one to open up. And we're like, you know, why, why, why are we over here? Like, we've got the heritage, you know. And that's when I started researching the history of Tennessee whiskey and seeing how rich and 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 fruitful it was, and yeah. you know how big of an industry it was, and how it just never really made a resurgence. And so we kind of came back and said, well, you know, we want to get in the whiskey business. You know, I remember selling Makers in the 2000s when it was really just, you know, people were just now kind of. St- Oh, you know, early 2000s, people were starting to realize that bourbon wasn't the cheap rock gut whiskey. You yeah, know? yeah. Scotch was the elitist whiskey, yeah. you know, and bourbon was the, the, the cheap man's whiskey, right? And, uh, and But now, you know, I remember there was a billboard here in Nashville that I always loved, and Makers, I think it said something like, it looks expensive and tastes expensive because it is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought, what a great, the yeah. one thing I give Bill Samuels and, Mar- and Makers, I mean, they were great marketers. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, unbelievable, which, Absolutely. I mean, but I always loved that billboard because it was just like so, <laughs> well, yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. Um, but them and then Woodford and, you know, some of these new brands were showing that, hey, there's room for premium bourbons. And we said, you know, why isn't there room for premium Tennessee whiskeys? Mm-hmm. So we kind of decided to come back home and and work on what it's going to take to build our own Tennessee whiskey. And so we started with cordials. Our original idea was to start with cordials or things we could do with young whiskey. So Whisper Creek was our first brand because one of the brands we saw over there everywhere was Bailey's. Okay. Yeah. And we realized that there's no competitor to Bailey's anywhere in the world. Yeah. You know, there's a ton of knockoffs, you know, lower price imitations. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of them are good, but they but they don't touch the volume of Bailey's. Yeah, and, and we started researching more and more in that cordial category, and the whole category is like that: Kahlua, Frangelico, you know, Grand Marnier, Cointreau, you know, go on and on and on. Saint Saint Germain, all these super premium cordials or higher price have twenty half price knockoffs, but they still own seventy percent of their market share. Yeah. And we were like, you know, so why don't we be first with some of those? So we came up with Whisper Creek, and then we did some flavored rise. Until twenty, were you distilling at that at that point? Yeah, or, we we okay. actually partnered with a guy named Mike Williams. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Williams owned Tennessee Distilling Company, uh, so he was one of the, he was he was really the man who changed the laws. You're going to hear every distillery you go to say they were part of it. Yeah, this is my challenge: is yeah. that I, I do I, I'm trying to figure out. Wait a second, who really was the the first after the the three uh, that you know. Richard it's funny. I, I, I hate calling people out, and I'm not going to say names, but I've been to a lot of distilleries, and they all claim that they were there. <laughs> they weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> they they might have shown their face for time or two. Yeah. The two guys who got it done were Mike Williams and Derek Bell. Mm. Derek Bell had a distillery in Bowling Green, and he really, you know, he's from Nashville, the Bell family, and he yeah. really wanted to bring his operation in Nashville. His family and Mike Williams went way back. Mike was a former legislator and was a lobbyist. Uh, you know, so he was a lobbyist for the, he doesn't take a lot of credit. He, 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 he sits back and kind of lets, you know, he was a good lobbyist, former legislator. So this is why everybody else can make their own story. Because yeah, because he doesn't really his own horn. Out front. Yeah. But he also represents the oil industry. So he had a day mm-hmm. job at the time. He always said, I like ethanol. I just like it in barrels. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was the guy who got it done. 
Uh, I mean, he, he really did. You know, there's other people that I know were in the photo. Heath Clark was around. Jim Massey was around. But the guy who got it done was Mike Williams. Mm. And the brainchild of how to do it was Mike Williams. Yeah. It wasn't, hey, we're going to change the law. It's, well, let's just write a law that lets each county will one time opt in. That way we're not saying, hey, it's legal. Because he knew how it was played. Like, he was a former state legislator. And, you know, it's not about fighting the teetotalers. It's about just, or getting them to be on your side. It's about getting them to just not fight you. Yeah. I learned a lot about politics from him. Like, it's, sometimes it's not about winning someone over. It's about, hey, I know you're not on my side, but will you just not be vocal? You know? <laughs> you know, because you, you know, there's a lot, about a third of the legislation just wouldn't vote on alcohol bills. Yeah. They just couldn't because of their constituents and where they're from. They may not be against it, but they just couldn't vote on it. Yeah. Well, a no vote's a no. So when you're walking in with a third of the votes as a no, you got to uphill you know, battle to, to, to beat there. I mean, yeah. that's not an easy hill to climb. So um, I would definitely say Mike Williams and Derek Bell. And anybody else who claims that they were part of it, I yeah. just kind of kind of just say good <laughs> thank you. Uh, and, and Derek everybody, is, everybody owes those two a big thank you. And Derek is Corsair. Derek is Corsair, yeah. yeah. Everybody yeah. everybody in the industry owes those two a thank you. Yeah. Um, they, they were the two that got it done. Now, um, you actually... So I heard uh, initially when you were doing some of your distilling, you were doing some of it over at Corsair? Yeah, so I, put, I helped Mike in the beginning while I was working on my business plan. So we came back in 2009 and you know we had to get money raised. We didn't have the money to do all this. We, we had sold our company, but it wasn't for retirement money. Right. You know, We had enough money to last us a couple of years to work on a business plan. And so we worked on writing a business plan, shaking the tin can to anybody we knew that had money that would listen to us. And meanwhile, I met Mike Williams <clears throat> through the, all the law changes. And so I went and kind of brokered. I started a broker business. So I just uh, basically a sales rep for hire. So I, I had about four or five brands would pay me to go and help them work with the local distributors here, go and work with retailers. Um, and so Mike Williams was one of them. And so I helped him. And he had his still, which is here, was at Corsair. So Corsair was the very first distillery to open up outside the three yeah. over a marathon. Um, and then... Our, you know, Mike Williams with Tennessee Distilling Company had his still there. Uh, uh, Jamie with Popcorn Sutton had his still over there. So there was three distilleries that were kind of in the same until we all kind of outgrew each other. And then in 2011, I signed the lease over here. And then Mike moved over here with me. Um, and then Popcorn moved up to Newport. Mm. I think sometime in the middle there, oh, Old Smokies opened up. I think they were the fifth, fourth or fifth. I never can keep up with the exact yeah. number. Um, <laughs> You know, where it's funny, the other people who said they were there at the law change, their distillers didn't open up for another six, seven years, but they yeah. were, they were yeah. there changing the law. <laughs> you know, it's like Mike, 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 was, Mike moved over here with us, so we kind of had a partnership where we bought all the front of the house, bottling, blending, you know, did all the sales, and then he set up the shop in the back. He did all the distilling, so we'd use, you know, he'd distill whiskey for us. We would do all the blending and bottling, and it was really a great partnership for, for, for a few years. And... I think what I learned about Mike is he he loved making whiskey. He hated the marketing of whiskey. You know? <laughs> um, nice. So in 2014, we actually uh, brought in a new partner, and then we bought Mike out. Well, but it was very mutual. We're still friends. He ended up raising money and going. He's now got the second largest distillery in the state. Now he's in Columbia. He's in Columbia. Right. Okay. Yeah. He doesn't even promote it. Most people don't even know he exists. Yeah. He really just does a lot of contract distilling. Now, don't be fooled. He's got a lot of barrels. Probably the most barrels kind of house accounted for the future that are, that are gonna be there for him to play with in the future. But he really took the co-packing model and turned into more co contract distilling like MGP. Cause yeah. when he and I first started here, we could go up and buy MGP four-year-old barrels for four fifty five hundred dollars a barrel all day. Mm. You know, wow. we never did that with Collier McKill, which yeah. was his the first brand of whiskey that he, he launched under it. But, um, it, you know, now if you can get them, it's 2,500, 3,000, 4,000, <laughs> however much per barrel it is. So he knew, he saw that demand growing, and he decided he liked making whiskey. He didn't want to mark, he didn't enjoy the marketing, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in this industry. And Mike was just like, I, that, that's just not my wheelhouse. So we, we, parted, we didn't part ways. We kind of, he went off, we did part ways, but we still worked together. I mean, we still sent a lot of business back and forth and friendly. And he's got a large, I call it, I always went into, I go, see him, like, you got yourself a big boy distillery here. <laughs> You've got two columns running. And, yeah. Um, and then we kind of 
bought here and then we we regrouped in 2014 because the first whiskey brand we did together was a brand called Collier and McKeel. Mm -hmm. It was his family brand. Um, I think Mike would admit this too and we both made the mistake of probably releasing it too early. Mm. Um, you know, it was big on Mike about, you know, one thing we liked about Mike is authenticity was important. Um, you know, to actually make it yourself. I mean, it's funny, I saw there's you know, the best distilleries, distiller, best of Nashville awards are coming out and those like best distilleries. If I go and buy a car and resell it, that doesn't make me a car manufacturer. Yeah. But for some reason in our industry, that makes you a distiller. Yeah. Um, I think it could be a best rectifier or a best brand builder or a best blender, but a distiller is a manufacturer. Yeah. And so that that's part of the industry really bothers me that I, I really wish we could actually separate the two. Yeah. And it was more clarifying. There's nothing wrong with blending and bottling. We do a lot of co-packing for other people here, but we don't do it for anybody that lies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to the credit of, of some of the distilleries, you know, they will say distilled in and let you know it's coming from. Well, they have else. to by law. They're supposed okay. to yeah. um, on bourbon and <clears throat> whiskey. They're supposed to. And I think most of them have gotten the hang of it back then. It was not cool to buy juice from MGP. Now it is. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there was, you know, a couple brands that took it on the chin for lying. And I think it woke up the rest of everybody else saying, well, we better be careful, you know. Right. Um, but the marketing side is still there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think just because you blend barrels, which I do believe blending is the art form, the lost art form. Everybody, if you make enough whiskey, you're going to make good single barrels on accident. Yeah. When 60% of your flavor comes from the barrel, a barrel can hide bad distillate and it can ruin good distillate, you know? Yeah. So there is something to single barrels, but the blending is a lost art form. But say you're a blender, you know, don't say you're a distiller. Because yeah. a distiller, you distill. Um, you know, um, if what uh, what was it in Bourbon Row? All the rectifiers in the history. When I go up, when I saw the Evan Williams tour, their new experience downtown is really cool. And yeah, talk about that street where everybody would, that was where the blending and rectifying. Scotland's done it for years. It's a huge right. part of the industry. Well, I mean, we talk about the George Dickel here in mm -hmm. town. That's what he was. He was a rectifier. Mm -hmm. That's what Nelson's Green Friar started out as. That's what uh, um, uh, Old Forester, all of those started out, uh, you know, as, as, as rectifiers. rectifiers. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. and, but, you know, I think the ones that are successful didn't ever, they told, they were honest from the start. Yeah. And I think a lot of people learned from the, from that, from the couple of people who did get caught lying. Yeah. That, well, the Bottled and Bond uh, Act really kind of changed things too, because it forced rectifiers to have to say, since we're not distilling our own and we can't put bottled in bond on it, we have to really show people that we're doing right. something that's not underhanded. Uh, exactly. So, and you know, we, so we bottled at the time. We bottled a lot of those brands that you see out now. I mean, there's seven, I think an eighth distillery is going to open up soon that started here with bottling with us. Cause it is a, it's an expensive industry to get into. Whiskey yeah. is not a poor man's business. If you've got to make something, lay it down, write the check for it, but then wait four or five years and do that every day, that's a that's a hard business to get into. So there's nothing wrong with right. It's like that's a good cash flow. We did vodka and we did on age things that we could do to pay for it. And we also did co packing. Yeah. But Mike and I, you know, we we, we had a he, his brand, Collier McKeel, is a great brand. Um, you know, we made the mistake of putting in smaller barrels and releasing it too soon. It's not bad whiskey, yeah. just you're still young. Yeah. And as the whiskey got older and better, you know, it was hard to get people to go back and retry it. Yeah. And so at that about that point, Mike decided, you know, I want to make whiskey. You know, it's really hard to market it, especially at the time when all these the, the, from 20, 2009 to 2013, the amount of craft distilleries that opened up because they were just blending and rectifying really put Mike at a disadvantage because he was really built on authenticity. Yeah. Um, and so we, we bought him out or we bought the equipment from him. And then he went and built a new distillery and does contract distilling now. You know, he said, if this whole industry exists, I'm going to at least make some money out of it and make whiskey, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, he now distills a lot of brands, um, you know, which then once again, I'm like, guys, tell the truth if you're distilling it or not. <laughs> you know, but now you don't have, now if they say distilled in Tennessee, yeah, that's all you got to say. Yeah. Um, so, but he, uh, so, but that sold off all the whiskey that he, he sold off the rest of his whiskey, you know, to help raise some money and then sold us the equipment and then went and did his thing. And then we got partnered with a guy named Tommy Bernard, who used to own Horizon Wine and Spirits, one of the largest wholesalers here in Kentucky. Um, 
and he put some money into us and we got to start over and we got the ability we came up that's when we decided to do vodka mm-hmm. we're like well we're gonna need something that we make today sell tomorrow um and take what we learned from him and we started making whiskey and making it every day and you know we didn't sell it we sold about 20 barrels when they were two and a half to three years old and then we didn't sell another lick of it until it was at least four wow. and now most of our whiskey is five to six yeah. um you know we're going to be limited on the size we can only do about 800 barrels a year at our capacity now so we're not trying to make entry-level whiskey we're trying to make big boy whiskey you know we yeah. want it to have, be deep and 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 have a linger to it and have some depth um you know i think we're reaping some good rewards it's tough because now there is so many other brands that basically instead of taking that money and putting it in the long term they're putting it into building faster yeah um but I think, you know, it's, I'm hoping the turtle in the hair race comes true. <laughs> um, but that was kind of, you know, we're starting to see the fruition, the fruits of the labor. And yeah. just getting to sell whiskey is exciting. I get to go up to, uh, I don't know when this is coming out. I'm not just announced the 25th, but I get to go up tomorrow to ADI in Louisville. Mm-hmm. And on Wednesday at the awards luncheon, uh, we won bourbon of the year. Oh, wow. Congratulations. And then only uh, since we won bourbon of the year, we went and won best whiskey of the year of all the best classes of whiskey. Wow. So it's going to be fun to get to go up to Louisville and take down bourbon of the year. In two days. So, <laughs> from Tennessee. From Tennessee. Yeah, there so you go. It's, uh, and, you know, and, they, and I think one good thing about ADI is in that category, that it's got to be, you've got to distill it. Yeah. So um, that's, it's going to be I'm pretty proud of that, my team here for that. So talk about your recipes and how you came up with your recipes for, because you, you do a rye, you do a, a bourbon, you do a Tennessee whiskey. Um, how did you come up with those, those formulas? Yeah, so, well, it's funny. So we, um, you know, we in 2014, we kind of regrouped. You know, we got to learn a lot from what we did right, but more importantly, what we did wrong and you know, learn from the mistakes of the first three years of distilling here. And, you know, we decided we we can't try to make, if we're limited on how many barrels we can make a year, we can't just sit here and try to make different whiskeys every day. You know, Derek Bale does a great job of that. Mm -hmm. He, he, man, he will throw anything together. And it's amazing. (laughs) Like, I I think one of my favorite things he does is I like his quinoa whiskey. Yeah. tried it. It's it's really smoky. It's got this, like, I just really enjoy that one. But he... You know, he, he does a lot of really interesting stuff. And he said, you know, we've got to be a little bit differentiation, but we really like the authenticity and the heritage of whiskey. And, you know, I was at a craft distillers panel in San Diego in 2013. And, you know, there was a bunch of other craft distillers defined craft and, oh, it's size. And, oh, he's got to be in a pot still. And, oh, it's this. And it got to me. I was like, I, I, don't, I think it's the definition of craft is art or skill. Mm. There's nothing about size. Yeah, I think us craft guys have hijacked the word craft instead and replaced micro with craft. There's a lot of micro distilleries that are terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a lot of micro distilleries that are really good. Yeah. Um, but to me, there's a lot of guys in Bardstown and Lynchburg and and Bullitt and County and Woodford County who I would say have mastered their craft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, they're, they're making really good stuff because they got generations on us, right? Yeah. They've got data and they know the processes. But what we learned from them is we, we reached out with Tommy and reached out to some really um, big Kentucky people. And we can't really market their names, but we had three big time master distillers that, we, that I sold their brands we worked for that came down here and we went up and worked with them. And, you know, what we learned is you're trying to be as consistent as you can in an inconsistent world. Mm. You know, the barrel is so effective, and which is why Tennessee and Kentucky is so nice because of the climate that gives us those, you know, all the in and outs and the, and the, and the variants and the hills to hide in yeah. um, <laughs> and the water. Mm-hmm. But, you know, with all those variants afterwards, you've got to be, it's, you don't have to have 50 different recipes to make a lot of different styles of whiskey. Yeah. That's in the blending art form. And so I kind of we kind of settled on what's our favorite Kentucky whiskeys and Kentucky bourbons and our favorite other styles and things people are doing. You know, you can take the same recipe and make it at 10 different distilleries and it's going to taste 10 different ways. Right. Right. So we learned that, you know, there is a lot of fluff to the marketing. Um, but we said, what do we like and what do we not like? And so I've always been a weeded fan, I think, because selling Maker's Mark 
right out of college and being part of that growth and seeing yeah. it and you know it's just you know i've always been a maker's mark ambassador um still love still i love their 46 program mm. I, i'm a big fan of their 46 program um it shows another way of you don't have to change your mash bill to create a whole nother slew exactly. of flavors right exactly um and so and they want to do a weed recipe um because of that uh, I've always been a big fan of Four Roses, mm-hmm. you know, doing two two mash bills with four yeast strains and and showing what the yeast can do, yeah. and and how he doesn't pump up the 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 the, 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 the specific gravity and tries to leave you know, uh, you know more f- residual sugars and you know I've always liked how his rise not just a, a what I call fighting whiskey. You know, yeah. there's some that I just call yeah. fighting whiskeys. Like you, you know, if you're drinking, put your hair up, guns out. You know, but his has his has those spice notes, but it's also got a lot of fruits and yeah. other things that that I've loved that I love. And so we kind of settled on those two styles. We're like, if we're gonna do a high rye, want to have that spice and fruit mixture, um, and then if we're gonna do a weeded, it's got to be a traditional weeded with you know nut, cra- and, you know, banana nut bread and graham cracker and all that and it's the, the brown sugar. And so we, that was easy. We we're like, all right, we're gonna do a weeded recipe and we're gonna do a, a, a high rye recipe. We knew we had to do a Tennessee whiskey, being in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. So we Why tested not, them. since nobody else could do it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we, we decided when we did charcoal mellowing testing, we found that the wheat just didn't stand up very well to mm. it. Um, wheat is a neutral grain. Yeah. It, it needs the barrel. You know, right. which is why we can go longer in the barrel. At least this is my opinion. Sorry, this isn't fact. But you know, when you when you when you go into you know when we were charcoal mellowing it, because it was so neutral, it was picking up so much of that sugar maple. It was it it need, it, it pulls the flavors from everything else, and and it was also taking what little few soils were coming through, and kind of just blanding it out. And so it kind of tasted bland to us. Yeah. Um. So we and then the rye obviously can stand up to a barrel. So that's why we settled, okay, the high rise is gonna be our Tennessee whiskey and the wheat is gonna be our bourbon. Um, and then I've always been a rye whiskey fan. Uh, you know, I, I love a good, for cocktails. That's yeah. always my cocktail whiskey. I drink bourbon pretty much neater on the rocks. If I'm making a Manhattan or if I'm making a, a old fashioned, I've always liked rye. Mm. I don't know why, I just, I think it stands up better in a cocktail. The the yeah. earliness to it, yeah. So we, with that, we're like, you know, everybody loves us 95.5 from MGP, so obviously we reached out to Larry Ebersold and we came down and we created our own, but we said, look, we change it up a little bit, so we do 100% rye, but we do 90% rye, 10% malted rye. And we we're gonna do 95.5, but what we found is malted rye, instead of when we replace malted, the malted barley with malted rye, Yeah. Malted rye doesn't have the enzymatic power of malted barley, so we had to up it a little bit. So it's really kind of, so our rye is kind of leans towards the MGP rye because yeah. we love that one. Our bourbon leans towards the Makers or Weller because we love those weeded bourbons. Um, and then our Tennessee whiskey kind of leans towards the Four Roses yeah. um, style. And so not that we're copying them, we kind of took what we liked about each one, but we did also do differences. You know, our Obviously, we charcoal mellow our rye. Our bourbon is definitely a higher wheat content than the makers are weller because we do get more wood extraction here. Yeah. So we, we wanted to. So you do actually, the, your high rye is the one that you charcoal mellow. You yes. Don't, you don't charcoal mellow the 100% no, rye. No, we don't charcoal mellow the rye, the 100% rye or yeah. the bourbon. Okay. Uh, we only charcoal mellow the Tennessee whiskey. Yeah. Um, and, but because, of the, because we also learned here from, you know, going and visiting with Jack, you know, they showed us the barrel staves and how their barrel staves, the soak lines, are almost an eighth inch farther than Woodford because they own both brands because mm. the climate is that much different, just yeah. 300 miles away. So we definitely upped our wheat mm-hmm. to, to stand up. We also toast all our barrels. Um, you know, everybody's a toasted barrel. All our barrels are toasted. That's just yeah. part of our thing. So you're here. toasting and charring or toasting just, and charring. Okay. All our barrels are toasted and charred because we go farther into the wood here. Yeah. And we're in a big bowl in Tennessee that just gets humid and hot. It feels like every day. <laughs> I guess there's Especially this, right now, yeah, it's pretty warm. I yeah. played golf this week, and for the first time, I'm just sitting out there like, oh, I can't even breathe. Like, you I'm, can see I got a sunburn yeah, yesterday. It's so, like uh, 85 degrees. It's not even that hot, but you just couldn't breathe. It's like breathing in a sauna. Yeah. You know, so yeah. um, we, we definitely toast and char. And we asked, we upped our wheat content in our bourbon to, to offset some of that as well. Um, we also use Tennessee white corn um, instead of feed corn we've really focused on with bourbons 51 percent corn yeah you know the corn is corn better be good yeah you know and i think 
the big guys, they, they have contract farmers who make their corn a certain way, but you know, we really believe that there's the corn is that's that's your base, right? So we we partnered with the farm. We well, all of our grain comes from local, but we really decided to do all Tennessee white corn. We're really excited. Our, our farmer actually grew uh, uh, heirloom blue corn for us mm. this year. So we're actually doing our first blue corn. Oh, really. interesting. We're yeah. actually doing one. It won't be out for probably five or six years, but we do it. It's a blue corn, white Tennessee white so rye, and Tennessee red winter wheat. So it's going to be our yeah. red, white, and blue bourbon. Well, I, I, <laughs> I'll say um, for Texas whiskey and Balcones. They do a blue corn whiskey, mm-hmm. and that's probably my favorite in their line because it's just a really nice, easy drinking whiskey. Yeah, that's what that's where we actually got when we tasted that because I think that's the difference between us and most other bourbons. I think the Tennessee white corn, it's got more starch, it's got a little bit more sweetness, it leaves behind more residual sugar, which I think turns into a little bit more of those fruit forward flavors. Yeah, um, and not when I say fruit forward, I'm looking for the dried fruits, not the bright ripe fruits. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a real big believer in corn, you know, now Four Roses has two different recipes, right? They got two different mash bills and we didn't have the, t- we didn't have the space. We want to do three recipes, a weeded rye and a, and a, and a bourbon. We do malt whiskeys and other things. We let the guys go back there. We do 20, 30 barrels, you know, a year of just test stuff that we play around with. But those are the ones we do incremental every 17 cooks, 17 cooks, 17 cooks over and over and over. Um, but I was actually reading a book. I, can't, I was trying to remember the book. It was a Chuck Cattery book, and it was talking about the. It was going into the history of bourbon, you know. And, and there was a section there where it talked about the Elijah Craig, you know, always claiming to be the first bourbon that used corn, rye, and malt. Yeah. And he had found something. It was like the Eli Mason papers, the third papers, or something, something. I can't remember, but they, there was a, a thing that predated the Elijah Craig. And it was called the Pennington method, mm. and. And when I, and it said the recipe was a sweet mash recipe instead of sour mash, but uh, but when I looked at the recipe and the breakdown, it was right in between the Four Roses mash bills. Ah, how convenient! <laughs> and I was like, well, I can't prove it's from me, but it's got my name on yeah. it. Yeah. So we test tested that and ran it, and we loved it. It was a very low malt, high rye, uh, high corn, and you know. For us, the malt is not a flavor profile. You know, it, well, the bourbon it is. Bourbon is higher, but in the rye and the Tennessee whiskey, it's it's very low. It's just there for the enzymatic power. Yeah, we want the rye and the corn to come out for it. So, it was like here it is: seventy percent corn, twenty five percent rye, five percent malt. It's kind of right in between those two, and it fit the style we we're going after. And it has your name on it. And it has our name on it. So <laughs> one day I'm going to spend some money on Ancestry.com because I know our family. I can trace us back here about three or four generations in Middle Tennessee. Yeah, I'm sure there's probably some point in time, but I do know there's a lot of Penningtons that from England and Scotland that kind of came over. So it's it's hard to trace it back. But one day I'm going to. We were talking about this earlier. One day I'm going to do the ancestry thing and figure out how to, how to tie it all See in. See if you can get a connection. Good luck in whiskey history because there's yeah. so much of that early history that it's easy for you to come up with these legends because there's really no way to prove whether it's true or not. Well, it's funny. I mean, I can prove that our family distilled. Yeah. You know, but what most people don't realize is in the late 1800s, in the turn of 1900, everybody distilled that had a farm. Yeah. If you had a farm, you had a still. Um, I mean, I, I can't remember the exact number of stills in Tennessee, but it's in the hundreds at the turn of 1900. There's a, one in just in Davidson County, where Nashville is, there were 60 registered stills in 1900. Mm. There's like eight or nine now. Yeah, yeah. And there's a little, <laughs> few more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just in Davidson County because, yeah. you know, it, it, whiskey was an agricultural business. You know, if you had farm and you had excess grain at the end of the year, what else are you going to do with it? Yeah. You know? You, well, these were the days before railroads or even once railroads started, people weren't really, uh, the, your market was around you. Exactly. Uh, and so you were selling everything to local, and but that was a way to hold on to your grain and not lose that yeah. revenue and actually make more. I think that's what farmers found out was they actually made more off of selling the well, my, liquor. My great grandmother had a farm called Seven Springs. It had Seven Springs on it. And it's actually now where Target is. Our spring house is still there. Uh, it's, it's it's still running and everything. I've just got to figure out how to get access to it. But mm. um, but yeah, she, she, that's what they do with the excess grain. Yeah. You know, they distill it off and that's what, you know, <laughs> get them through the winter. You know, yeah. that was their, their you know, 
give it away to some friends. I don't know if they sold it, but yeah. I can, you know, everybody says, oh, my great, great, great grandfather, or my great grandmother, or my great this, or great aunt. I think anybody can tie themselves to distilling yeah. if they came from anywhere rural that had that farmed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking in my own family, if that's possible, we came from a line of tailors. So, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, they didn't have a need for distilling really at, at that point. And we came through Canada. Maybe there was a chance there, but um, we knows? did a lot of farm. My family had a lot of farms, northern Alabama and southern Tennessee. You know where the border is. Uh, our family farm's still down there, and then uh, I'm southern in, in Williamson County. So I mean, that's what Tennessee was. It was agricultural. Yeah. So it's always fun to say, "Oh, we had more stills than any state in the union prior to prohibition, and the least after." But you know, <laughs> a lot of them were just just farm stills. Yeah, yeah. So um, you also do a four grain, yes, bourbon. Now is that. Um, is that a blend or is that uh... it's a blend of our Tennessee whiskey and our bourbon okay so it is a it is a bourbon yeah by definition um, but it has it's our kind of unique one that we get to have fun with it's and that's gonna be our red white and blue actually because yeah. we're gonna do white right you know with blue corn because it's a blue label eventually we'll switch over to that but what happened was we uh, in 2017 we had released, we had, were tasting through some of the barrels and, you know, profiling barrels. Because every, every time when barrels turn two and four and five and six, uh, we pull samples and we kind of profile them. Mm-hmm. And we put them into different categories. Like, oh, it's a, a blend. You know, we kind of have, for all of our brands, we have like three or four different blending characteristics. So we have our own keywords. Like it's a caramel barrel or it's a, a, a grapefruit IPA barrel or a, this barrel, you know. Uh, and then we'll, if it's a single barrel, you know, we'll classify it as a single barrel. It's like, man, it's really depth. You know, it's got a lot of depth. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes you get a, a, a blending of Whisper Creek barrels, you know, or a barrel that needs more age. You yeah, know? yeah. There's always, a, and, then the, and then you get a dead barrel. It's empty. That's always sad. I, I never realized that was a real thing. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> until the, we, until we started harvesting, the, was just, the, the whole thing would evaporate. Yeah, yeah. So I called a couple of distilleries, big guys. Oh yeah, about one out of a hundred. I was like, whoa, <laughs> I was like, that seems like a lot. Yeah. You know? But yeah. Uh, so we were profiling and we we're profiling the rye, the hundred percent rye. We're like, oh my gosh, these barrels are delicious. And we found about 20 barrels that were like, these are ready. Like, you know, cause we always said it's not a minimum time. It's whenever it's ready. And the honest answer is when we needed cash flow. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, if we got, if the longer I go now, the Tennessee whiskey, I think, Probably six to eight years will be the sweet spot. I don't think we'll really want to go much. You can go older. I yeah. love 12 and 15 and 20 year old. I don't really love them. I love Weller 12. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of super aged whiskeys, American whiskeys. Again, it comes down to the weeded ones seem to be the ones. Because that... they can stand up time. Yeah. Uh, I feel like one, I, I feel like you can, you can over oak whiskey. Yeah. And, you know, so to me, I think the Tennessee whiskey will probably never be much older than eight, but. And that 100% rye just, it picked up the flavors of the barrel and it just mellowed out so well. Yeah. So we're like, you know, let's, these are ready. And so we released about 20 barrels. We did them just as single barrels because we didn't want to try to create a blend that we had to recreate, right? Yeah. Um, and we sold it out so quick. We're like, oh, shoot. Now we got the name out there a little early. What are we going to do for another year or two? Because I didn't want to, I don't want to sell anything before four years yeah. old. And I kind of, so we're like, what could we do? So we're like, you know what? We could do a four grain. So we kind of create four grain that we could do with the Tennessee whiskey and the bourbon, and we had barrels that we had blended already. So we're like, all right. So we kind of came up with that. And the unique thing about that is every batch is a little different. That's our mm-hmm. goal to make the most balanced whiskey. Yeah. Um, but surprisingly, you know, nobody really knew a four grain. I mean, Taylor had a four grain, but there wasn't a lot of other four grain bourbons out there. Yeah. But we, our four grain has been really, it does, it sells just as well as the bourbon and Tennessee whiskey, shockingly. So yeah, yeah. I, I love it. It's, it. it's, it's our way of making a balanced whiskey. I had to scratch my head when uh, in, in South Carolina, where I live, a local distillery came out with a five grain bourbon. And I went, is that legal? And I thought, I had to look it up. And as long as it's 51% use, corn. Yeah, use as many uh, I think Derek, as Derek you won a, a whiskey of the year one time for one called Insane in the Grain. <laughs> I think it had 13 or 14 different grains. Really? In it. Yeah. Okay. Wow. He could never recreate it because he could never get the same grains again. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. Good. It was called Insane in the Grain. So when I did your tour, uh, after the tour was over, I was looking at, uh, I was doing the tasting and I was determined through the whole tour that I was going to buy the rye because I said, you know, 
for me, I love rye, and I definitely like rye without the corn influence. And so that was the one that I was going to get. And after doing the tasting, I walked out with the four grain. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I did. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons we did the rye uh, with 100%. Yeah. You know, you can add 49% corn to it, you yeah. know, and it ups the level. It's, re yes, the corn adds some viscosity and some sweetness and stuff like that. But I think it also adds to the burn. Yeah. The necktie. Yeah. We call it exactly. the necktie, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it also ups the yield tremendously. Yeah. Right. I mean, rye costs us three times the amount in grain and it gives us half the yield. So, you know, you can throw some corn in. It's like the old sugar shiners. Throw a little sugar in. You can add it up. You know, yeah, I think that was one of the reasons rye. But what we found because we pot distill everything is we get a good viscosity and we get some sweetness through on just about everything because we don't have the, the technology that Buffalo Trace and Jim Beam and Jack Daniels have. They're getting every ounce they can of conversion out. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've got the blenders to blend the flavors on the backside and they've got the sure mass amount of barrels to make a consistent whiskey. Right. I mean, the fact that you can buy those brands anywhere in the world, and they taste the same. I don't think people give that enough credit. <laughs> I mean, exactly. Um, but for us, you know, we we don't we we're not able to get every ounce of sugar converted every I mean, we're small. So we get that viscosity. So what we found with that rise, that rise actually got a body to it. Mm -hmm without the corn influence. And yeah. and so that's that was a big thing to me, was to not have corn in it. And you don't chill filter. We don't chill filter any yeah. of our whiskeys. And I think that's a difference too, because yeah. big guys all, uh, most If you're below them. 90 proof, you probably, you know, you probably should, because what we've learned is if you do something below 90 proof, when it gets cold, the, it gets the, cloudy. It gets and, cloudy, the corn hates. But see, I'm out. trying to uh, educate people, like with scotch. If your scotch goes cloudy, that's a good thing yeah. because what it's saying is that you're, it's not been chill filtered. And so you're, you're getting all of those natural oils that are in there. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not being stripped away as you're running it through the chill filtering process. I'm interested to see, you know, I, I've always been a Scotch, you know, Scotch is obviously the, the grandfather or great grandfather, great triple great grandfather of whiskey, right? Yeah. I mean, Tennessee and Kentucky, we were mostly Scotch and Irish, Irish settlers that came over from the Whiskey Rebellion. They came over the mountains. They said, oh, we got all these places to hide. And, and they found in the mountains, they had, to, you know, they brought the tradition with them. But I'm really interested to see how Buffalo Trace's uh, temp control room does with super aged whiskeys. I don't know if you've done much. Mm, no, no. I've read really about it, but they built this that. whole warehouse where they're going to try to make a, you know, very tempered climate like Scotland. Yeah. Because that's the thing. We've got the great ways to make whiskey quicker, yeah. I guess you could say. I hate that word. You know, where the whiskey goes in and out because you've got those changes in volatility. But what will bourbon do over a long period of time in the condition if that you would have If it's not pushed Scotland? all the way out, yeah. right, into yeah. the woods. So I'm, I'm really interested. Now, I don't have the money to do that, so yeah. I'm glad they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll all learn from it. Yeah, exactly. And then you can just keep it in your house somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it might be 20 years before you read about it, but I'm yeah. young enough to know. Well, that's true. That's true. So, so you are... Um, Pennington, I see Speakeasy Spirits as a name also associated and Davidson Reserve. Do you, how do you fight the challenge of all the different uh, names that you have going on? Originally, the reason Speakeasy Spirits, our corporate name is Speakeasy Spirits. Mm -hmm. um, when we were starting this and doing a business plan, we started a company called Speakeasy Marketing. And that's where we did sales for other brands. And we'd still, my wife still runs that company. It's still, we do promotions and uh, activations for the big, you know, big companies. Yeah. Um, so we walked a fine line for a while of doing promotions and marketing for the big, you know, still do for the big companies while we played distillery over here. Uh, we also, you know, save money by just changing. We use the same logo instead of Speakeasy Market and Speakeasy Spirits, right? Yeah, yeah. When you're when you're a bootstrapper, you know, <laughs> and you don't have, you know, you don't take venture money. You got to do what you can. So uh, we did that, and we purposely kind of separated the brands. Um, being that we are former distributors and sales reps, we look at the top ten, top twenty, top thirty brands in the country. They all do one thing. You know, Jack Daniels doesn't make vodka. Bacardi doesn't make whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, Bombay doesn't make rum. You know, like they all do one thing. Their distilleries make a bunch of stuff. Yeah. You know, you can go to Jim Beam, who I haven't heard of Jim Beam vodka or Jim Beam gin, but I promise you, if you go to their distillery, you're going to see 
gin and vodka being made. Well, they're working on the American single malt now yeah. and other things. So, yeah. yeah they. But, I mean, they make vodkas and gins and bottle it there, but it's a different brand. Yeah. You know, so I think they've trained consumers that a brand does one thing well. Yeah. And I don't know. The only brand I can ever think of that crossed over categories was Seagram's. Mm. You know, back in the day, they had Seagram's whiskey, Seagram's gin, Seagram's vodka. That's the only brand I could really look at in the history since I've been alive, uh, which is a very short history, but um, that's crossed over, right? And then I started looking at the craft brands, the ones that have made it, Stranahan's, Tito's, you know, once again. Yeah, one thing. One thing. And once, but once again, that doesn't mean their distilleries didn't bottle or make other things. They just separated the brand so that in consumers' minds, this brand does this. It's a more expensive route to go because you have to market each one. Yeah. But for us, that was a, str- a specific strategy for us. Uh, we looked around the country, and there's a lot of craft distilleries. I think uh, read Mark Brown's report of 90% of, or it's like 92% of craft distilleries sell less than 5,000 cases a year. Mm. I don't know how 92% of craft distilleries <laughs> survive, survive yeah. that, at that rate. <laughs> yeah. Unless they're just a glorified, unless it's just a hobby or they've got a just it's a glorified retail store. Yeah. Um, where you're just keeping all the margin. They got a side hustle. There's a side hustle going on somewhere. (laughs) You're still still keeping your day job. Yeah. Um, But, you know, a lot of these craft distilleries, it's one name across all their brands because it was easy like that. Yeah. You know, people say, I'm not accusing them of narcissism. It's not, there's not like a, I think it's just easier and less expensive to do that. But we look at, okay, well, what if a whiskey person tastes your vodka and they're like, I don't like that. I think, would that influence them to not try your whiskey later? Or what if a vodka drinker drank your cream liqueur or your gin, they didn't like it because they're vodka drinkers. Yeah. Would they not try your vodka later? Yeah. And from us, the history of spirits shows the answer is yes. People are very loyal to what they drink. People, mm-hmm. you know, especially in liquor. If you drink Kettle One, you're not a vodka drinker. You're a Kettle One drinker. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, bourbon's the first one in a while where people will drink all kinds of bourbons. Now everybody's gonna have their favorite go tos, but in gin, vodka, rum, you know, traditionally bourbon, you were a jack drinker, you know, you typically drink a brand. Yeah. And very rarely you say, you know what, I'm gonna try their gin, I'm gonna try their rum, you know, because it's just not what happened. So we specifically kind of kept our name out of it and we had we're brand, we always want to be seen as brand creators. Okay. That's what we like doing. My wife is a great, she designs and develop, you know, does all the design and development of all the brands. So we always want to be, we, Speakeasy Spirit Sauce is a brand company. Mm-hmm. And so we specifically have Whisper Creek. Or we kind of have three pillars of our brands. We have Whisper Creek, which is our cream liqueur. We're actually coming out with, you have to try it today before you leave, our coffee Spiked coffees. Oh, nice. We just Ooh. canned them this weekend. It's actually, we cold brew the coffee. Oh, wow. It's real coffee. So it's a okay. to one cup of coffee, and it's got a shot of whiskey in it. Nice. Um, and we have Pickers, which is our vodka line. Now we've got our vo- flavor vodkas. Then we have our canned cocktails. And then we have Davidson Reserve, which is our whiskey line. Yep. Um, we may create some other brands, uh, some other labels of whiskey that might be sourced or some other things in the future. Um, we do have our crafted cordials, which is just a cordial line. Once again, we don't market that. That's something no one really pays attention to. It's, it's in the well. But once right. we started making vodka, we're like, well, why can't we make triple sack? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, that's why people go to gin, because I'm making vodka. Why don't I make gin? Yeah, I love it. I go to all these bars. My favorite thing in the world is going to a craft bar, and they're like, we don't sell flavored vodka. I'm like, you've got like 15 of them on the back bar. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, gin's flavored vodka. No, it's not. I'm like, yeah, it is, but all yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> and then we have our Walton's vodka, which is very small. We've got some smaller, very small craft. Uh, okay micro brands but the three pillars are those three um in 2014 when we redid this thing this neighborhood over here you didn't come to i mean when we signed the lease here in 2011 unless you want to get shot at at night you didn't come (laughs) over this neighborhood yeah this neighborhood flipped really fast and really Mm -hmm. quickly and then fat bottom opened up and we decided to open up a tasting room well speakeasy spirits doesn't say distillery so we decided to make this campus pennington distilling company okay so the idea is if we do ever have another distillery or we separate, it would, might have another distilling name. Yeah. Kind of like Brown, Speaky Spirits is Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels is the distillery. Nice. Um, it's kind of how we went. We're like, you know, now that we're making whiskey, you know, we're selling actual grain and bottle whiskey and we're having a tasting room, we need a name that says distillery. Yeah. And so that's why we kind of did a DBA for this plant, Pennington Distilling Company, later. The, ch- the challenge is, and I get this with, uh, you know, I 
do Travel Fuel's Life, I do Whiskey Lore, and then it's like, where do I put on a business card yeah, that exactly. people would know? So I put it on both sides. But, um, you know, it's it's that, that whole kind of challenge of uh, when somebody is doing a view on the Tennessee Whiskey Trail and saying, where does Davidson Reserve come from? You know, mm-hmm. that's the challenge is getting that connection yeah. between the two. We, we're we're going to fight that for a while. And I always fight. But it's fun because some people come here for Davidson. Yeah. Like, y'all make pickers? My uh, wife nice. loves pickers. Or yeah. some people come here for pickers. Y'all make Davidson? And it's like, yeah. So, But we, we, we always want to be brand first because we're, we do a lot more traditional distribution from a craft distillery than most craft distilleries. Uh, you know, we, 2020 was actually good to us because our retail tasting room was less than 5% of our total revenue. Mm. Where most distilleries, it's probably, it's at least double digits, if not most, 40, 50, 60, some of them 80, 90%. Yeah. You know, a lot of them depend on that event business and that tasting room business. We've all, being that we were all former distributors, we really focus on distribution. You don't make as good of margins, but you get better, you, you get farther distribution out there. Right. Well, when you're in a liquor store, nobody cares what still the, where it's made. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think yeah. the brands have shown that. They, 90% of consumers don't know where any brands are made. You know, yeah. uh, they'd be shocked if they did. <laughs> you know, what do you mean all these brands come from Connecticut? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, well, they, you know, Diageo's got a big bottling plant there. You yeah. know, so. We really wanted to be brand specific, brand oriented, uh, which then paid off last year because last year when you know nobody's doing tours or tastings, guess what boomed? Retail liquor. Yeah, and yeah. and so our you know that that paid dividends for us last year. But now we are really heavily focused this year on growing that side of the business. So mm-hmm. we're 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 constantly fighting that battle. Of how do we relate Davidson to here? Yeah, and Pickers to here instead of just Pennington Distilling Company. So it, it will be an ongoing challenge. Well, thank you for taking the the mask off of some of these uh, things about Tennessee coming back into the whiskey industry and uh, helping me understand that a little bit more. It'll be fun. Because it is tricky to to work through all of that. It's going to be fun, though. It's it's fun. fun. Now that you've got so many brands that have their own distillate coming out. Yeah. And I think more coming. I can't wait till the day. It might not be too far in the future that we're going to have a Tennessee whiskey back bar not maybe not as big as Kentucky bourbon, yeah. But we're gonna start having our own and having our own list. I remember back in the day when Jack would be on the bourbon list, and you'd be like, "It's not bourbon." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that argument! Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it is bourbon. But they specifically wanted to be separated, yeah. and so now you know, I think we're gonna have our own list soon, and we are. You're already seeing it, but yeah, when it starts spreading out to other states, it's gonna be fun. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you uh, walking me through all of this and and really getting. Uh, a sense of what you guys are doing and uh, now maybe people will make that connection between Pennington to let me go do a trip over there so I can yeah. learn more about Davidson Reserve. So. Yeah, please come by. It's open Tuesday through Sunday, 11 to 5. A little shout out for that. So we we just uh, opened that up. We were only open a couple of days a week till this year. So nice. please come by any day. We've got a great tour group out there. Chris and his team will, will walk you through and do a tasting. It's a lot of fun. Well, I wish you the most success, and uh, I will be uh, back in Nashville often since uh, so much more whiskey here than there used to be. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank well, you. Cheers. Cheers. And if you want to schedule tours or learn more about Davidson Reserve, just head to davidsonreserve.com. And if you enjoyed this interview, make sure that you subscribe to this all-new podcast. And if you can't get enough of whiskey history, check out the original Whiskey Lore podcast on your favorite app. Find show notes, transcripts, social media links, books, and swag all at whiskey-lore.com. And you can support this independent podcast by joining the Whiskey Lore Society at patreon.com slash whiskey lore. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and until next time, cheers and slanjava. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC.